Good morning, everybody. Yay, it's Tuesday. Good morning. There's only three more class days before the end of the course. Isn't that crazy? Two more. Oh, yeah. In addition to this one. That's right. Got to count correctly, right? Okay, so let's get cracking because we have a lot of stuff to do. So today it's going to be a bit of a weird day because I have a meeting at 12.15 for 15 minutes between lectures. So we're going to go a little bit longer and uh, finish this lecture a little bit later than usual. And then the next one will be a little bit shorter than usual. So hopefully the same amount of time more or less uh minus you know toilet breaks and stuff hello, hello. um but just going to switch it around a little bit so i have the opportunity to make that meeting for 15 minutes anyway okay so let's get back to where we were at all right so what we're going to do is we're going to start with so this is all about control of gene expression or gene regulation. And we're going to cover this in terms of both prokaryotes and eukaryotes because they have some very different ways of uh, controlling expression of their genes, uh, which are really tied into, you know, their genetic architecture and the, you know, how they do stuff, the kind of environments they're likely to find, things like that. Control of gene expression in prokaryotes is uh, really at the level of transcription, uh, by and large. Yeah, pretty much entirely, to be honest. So in some ways, it's simpler than eukaryotes, because in eukaryotes, there are lots of different ways you can control gene expression. But in other ways, it's more complex because the actual mechanisms they use are more involved, right? So it's kind of a bit of a, you know, six or one half dozen, the other kind of deal. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to cover prokaryotes first, because as I said, in some ways they're simpler. And then on Thursday, we'll get to eukaryotes, right, which are much more complex in how many different ways they do things, but different. We're also going to start off not with like what you've got on your screen, because uh, that may be a little bit uh, imposing, maybe. Uh, but we'll start talking about the general principles of gene regulation, right? So you get some kind of, you know, gentle lead into this process without me just kind of dropping you, kicking and screaming in the middle of the pool. Okay, so we'll come back to this image in a little bit. It's a very good one, but there's a lot here to pass out, and we'll do that in a little while. So first you know, what we were talking about last lecture is really all about, you know, why do you need to control the expression of a gene, right? What is gene regulation all about? And that's really all about, you know, where, how much, where's it gonna end up? What needs doing to it? You know, what is it expressed in response to? All kinds of questions, right? Got to remember that DNA is just information. Really, it doesn't do anything else. It just sits there, right? It's how you use it that makes a difference. Just the same as you could have a, you know, a book on, you know, uh, subatomic particle theory sitting on your shelf, but it doesn't make you a theoretical physicist, right? You know, it's how you use that information that matters. I mean, totally, it could sit on my shelf. I'd never read it, right? Because I wouldn't understand what they're talking about. So in terms of the ways in which regulation occurs, some of these apply to prokaryotes, others are really eukaryotic specific, right? And so the idea of this is that there are many different levels on which regulation can occur. It can occur at the time of transcription. So do you transcribe or not? this gene, right? It can occur at the level of RNA processing in eukaryotes. 
do you translate that transcript or not? Right. That is more of a, uh, essentially, everything after transcriptional regulation is really more eukaryotic than prokaryotic. How long does that transcript hang around for, right? Not all transcripts, not all mRNAs are equal in terms of how long they persist. Some are come and go just like that. Others are produced at a low level, but hang around forever. And then obviously, once you get a protein, what do you do to that protein? Like, where does it go? What modifications does it have and the like? We'll talk a lot more about, you know, two through five when we get to eukaryotic gene regulation on Thursday. I'm not going to worry about it right now. That's just to kind of give you the kind of bigger picture context, essentially. So before we get into the weeds with our two examples in bacteria, I want to introduce some kind of general concepts. And it's really important to get these because it will help a lot figuring out what does what, right? And so really, we're going to be using a bunch of terms, right? Again, so this is more language, essentially. And we're going to use four different terms. Let me write these up. Where be the chat? Chat, chat, chat. Ah, there be the chat. Come on. Right, and so these are the terms we're going to use. <laughs> my dog's just been out for a walk, my big dog. And so she's busy panting uh, on the floor. And so the key thing to remember is what is, these refer to the effect that your, whatever you're doing has on gene regulation or gene expression. And it's really on transcription. So positive regulation equal turns transcription on, essentially, right? Because it's you're talking about the effect that whatever protein or whatever is having positive it's good right you know you're kind of having something happen right so it's turning transcription on obviously negative is the opposite of that now we get into the kind of trickier words inducible and repressible and we'll get through, we'll work through the the PowerPoint slides as well. They've got some good images. I just want you to have these words in your lexicon, right, before we start.
Right. So induce for basically means you're inducing expression to be on. Now, again, we're not talking about what the mechanism of that is. We're just talking about the outcome. Right. In the presence of something, whatever that might be, expression or transcription is turned on. And then maybe we'll get some of this is a little trickier. We'll get to how these terms differ, right, between positive and negative on one hand and inducible and repressible on the other. Right, because there's some not splitting of hairs, but there's some kind of subtlety here. And repressible is the opposite. Oh. Hey, love, you got coffee in the pot, sweetheart. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's time to catch up on notes. Something as well that's got to be added to this, right? And so in positive regulation, the default is that transcription is off. And that's typical in eukaryotes. In negative regulation, default, oops, i to spell that right, is that transcription is on, and that's typical in prokaryotes, and has to be turned off. And again, it can be a little confusing, like putting these terms together. But all you have to do is keep in mind what is the outcome, right? What's the out? What's the normal state of the system, and what's the outcome once we start adding stuff to it? It's really kind of like a series of logic gates that you work through. Okay, what's its normal state? What do we have to do with it to turn it on or off, as the case may be? Okay, so that's the language, right? We'll get we'll refine that a bit 
in a little while when we get to the actual examples. And so when we talk about negative regulation, it's typically on and has to be turned off, right? The thing that turns it off is a repressor. Right, so something physically has to bind, and that something's usually a protein, to stop that gene from being transcribed. And so that would look something like this. Nope. Uh, no, we don't have an example of that. Shit. That's unfortunate. It's kind of the opposite of what I'm about to show you on the next page. In positive regulation, it's the opposite. So normally in the absence of anything, right, just plain DNA, right, no other factors involved, there is no transcription. So the default state is off. You need to add something, and that something is typically a protein, transcriptional activated protein in eukaryotes, is required to turn transcription on. So if you look at that, you know, this uh, picture here, in the absence of anything, no transcription. And you will have part of the DNA of that gene, typically the promoter, where <coughs> that protein, which that protein will recognize and it will have to bind to be able to turn on transcription. Okay. Now, if you kind of swap these arrows around, and you'd have negative regulation. So if instead, in negative regulation, you would have transcription when there is just bare DNA, and you'd have to have the binding of a protein to stop that, right? So positive and negative are, as one would expect, polar opposites. Positive requires the binding of something to turn it on, because that's the outcome, it's a positive outcome. Negative regulation is on already. It needs the binding of something to turn it off. And if anyone has any questions, really stop me as I go. Don't let it go because we're going to be getting to more and more complex concepts as we move through. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say bears. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's right. They're complete polar opposites. Exactly. Right. And it's really important to remember the, oh, 
there are kind of extra wrinkles. We're going to take this kind of steady, Adam, because I don't want to overwhelm you uh, with jargon kind of all at once. So it's really important to remember what is the default state in the absence of anything else. If you just have bare DNA, let's say, like in a test tube and the transcription machinery, what would happen? Would you get transcription or not? So in negative, it's always on because you have to be, do something negative to turn it off, right? That's the outcome. And positive, you have to do something positive to turn it on, right? So if you just had that bare DNA and you know RNA polymerase and stuff in a test tube, you would get no transcription in positive regulation. You'd have to add something in order to get that uh, gene transcribed. So the default state is in the absence of any extra players, I guess, any extra proteins. What is the level of transcription from that gene? So let me type that down. So if the default state is on, you'll get transcription. If you just add the transcription machinery, RNA polymerase and the other jazz, and DNA. RNA polymerase will bind that DNA, it will transcribe it, you'll get mRNA. And that, even if nothing else is present. That's typical in bacteria and prokaryotes. If the default state is off, under those same conditions, you will not get transcription. It's kind of like teenagers and light switches. You know, default state of a teenager's lights in their room is always on. You have to go in there and, you know, turn it off. You have to be negative. Turn off your lights. You know, the default state for people who are paying the electricity bill is off, right? Because if I'm not there, I don't need the lights on. So I have to do something positive. I have to flick the switch, turn the lights on. That's essentially the idea. Yes. Well, just any of them, to be honest. It's funny because my dad was always used to shout at me, turn your bloody lights off, Matthew. And I was like, yeah, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. It's only electricity. And now I'm doing the same to my kids, which is kind of funny. Does that help, Adam? Yes, I'm still typing. Cool. <laughs> if you're still typing, you need time, just let me know before I start chunching again, OK? Okay.
You good? Yeah, the chat box is pretty unforgiving of typos, right? Now, to add the wrinkles, right? So now we're getting into, we've kind of got the basic framework. Now we're going to start adding, you know, tweaks to that. Hello, girl. And so now we're going to talk about inducible and repressible. So in inducible transcription, you have to induce something to leave. Ah, come on. So here's the logic train, right? Transcription is normally on. Repressor binds to turn transcription off. Repressor has to be induced to leave to turn transcription on. So I say, as long as you kind of work through, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, then it's you know a little bit easier to make sense of what's going on. So to look at that, you know, diagrammatically, which is always a little easier. Here's our gene and our regulatory region. We have a repressor bound to that region, right? So we have no transcription. In the absence of that repressor, we will have transcription. Right, so that repressor is turning things off, right? This is like the negative part that we're talking about. Okay. Oh. Our little little bit is at the the vets. No. Can do a lot of surgery on her, so getting filled in by my wife. Okay, so transcription are normally on, repressor binds, turns it off. So that's our negative regulation. We have to do something to stop it from being transcribed. So to get it to be transcribed, we have to induce that repressor to leave. And so only in the presence of that inducer, whatever that might be, 
will that repressor leave and you'll get transcription. which is what we're talking about here. Just covering that up so it doesn't like make your eyes stray and confuse things. So again, in the, when the absence of any other factors, no proteins, nothing, just RNA polymerase, even though that's protein, obviously, you'll get transcription. However, normally a repressor is present and stops transcription. So DNA plus repressor equals no transcription. DNA plus repressor, repressor there, plus inducer equals transcription, because that repressor is now induced to leave. How does that make sense? Could you repeat the question again? Oh, statement? Yeah, statement. <laughs> so just bare bones, only DNA and RNA polymerase, you get transcription. Add in a repressor, you'll get no transcription because the repressor blocks transcription. This isn't repressible, right? Because essentially the default state in the cell is DNA plus repressor. Now, if you want to get rid of that repressor and turn the gene on, you have to induce the repressor to leave. So in a test tube, right, essentially, DNA and RNA polymerase, you'll get gene expression, but bacteria aren't test tubes. So you're gonna have your DNA and RNA polymerase where normally, you get transcription, but you have a repressor that binds to that gene and stops transcription, right? So in a normal state, that transcription is off. You have to add an inducer to get rid of the repressor to allow transcription to occur. This is where we get into those kind of subtle differences. Now in repressible transcription, the default state is on, right? So in the absence of protein, you'll get transcription and that repressor that's present will not bind on its own. 
right? So this is one of the big differences in inducible. Now, let me write this down. In repressible transcription, the repressor will not bind on its own and needs a co-repressor to bind DNA. Where is it with me and double typing words today? and turn off transcription. So now if you look at repressible transcription, in the absence of the co-repressor, you'll get transcription. because this repressor here is not in the correct form that allows it to bind DNA. It needs a co-repressor to change shape, basically, and recognize DNA. However, when that co-repressor is present, the two things together, apo-repressor and co-repressor, now combine the gene and prevent transcription. So again, we have to think about the outcome. You can repress transcription. It's repressible because you're turning it off. So B would be negative inducible transcription. And that's negative because DNA alone equals transcription inducible because normally a repressor is bound. I'm going to spend a lot of time on these terms because it's really important to kind of get what's going on in the broadest possible terms first before we get into the details. I'm sorry if I appear tired. I've been in meetings since nine o'clock this morning, so I'm a little bit wiped already, unfortunately. A 
and C would be negative, oops, repressible. And the same again, negative because DNA alone equals transcription, repressible because Compressor alone doesn't bind. Needs an, an extra factor, basically. Okay, how are we doing so far? Still taking notes. I'm mourning the absence of coffee. Very sad. Sometimes I feel like I just have an IV drip sitting next to my couch and just kind of plug it in with some sweet coffee in the bag or something like that and just mainline it instead that would be that would be useful All right, who needs clarification? Good with notes? Cool. Anyone else? Robert, you okay? Okay. All right, and so, haha, <laughs> add more wrinkles, right? There's extra stuff. And this is kind of what I've been saying all along. And there's actually, you know, you can both positively and negatively regulate uh the same gene depending on conditions and how you're going to be fine tuning the expression from that gene right as a as another way of thinking about it it's not just an all or nothing on or off deal it you know in in all systems in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes right and we'll we'll be getting to that in a little bit as i've said negative regulation is much more common in prokaryotes typically in prokaryotes genes are on unless they're told not to be. The opposite is the case in eukaryotes. The vast majority of our genes are off at any one time, right? And they have to be told to be turned on, right? Also, we have a, an extra concept and that is one of autoregulation. So essentially many genes 
work in a kind of a feedback loop. So that whatever is produced by the protein that that gene encodes can have an effect back on the transcription of that gene. So it's kind of like a way of homeostasis. You know, you kind of get hot, you sweat, you cool back down again. With gene expression, you produce a product, you know, the protein, that protein produces a product. You don't need as much of the protein anymore. That product is then sensed somehow and used to turn off gene expression or kind of dial things down a little bit. Okay. Oops. I don't mean to do that. Sorry. Let's get us back again. And so as we talked about oh last section. Bacterial genes are typically organized into an operon. Not always, but quite commonly. And those transcription from an operon, right, which is all of the structural genes and the regulatory gump, right, and let's kind of move, expand this a little bit. The mRNA is polycystronic. So basically a cistron equals coding region. Didn't we, we should have gone over that. Yeah, we went over that in um, transcription in prokaryotes. Hang on, give me a second, I'll pull that up. Um, So polycystronic if I can spell it right, called multiple coding regions in one mRNA. Where was it? No, it's not in that one. It's in there somewhere, it should be at least. There you go. I know it's in there somewhere. Yeah, this is where we covered it uh, before. Not kind of calling you out or anything, but I kind of wanted to check, make sure, and I was pretty sure it was in there as well. Um, but yeah, so that's really kind of where this is coming from, essentially, right? So now we're going to have essentially all of the components, right, in a pathway are going to be grouped together. So we can coordinate or bacteria coordinate the regulation of those individual components by grouping them together in the same mRNA, right? So that you just have to control the expression of that mRNA or transcription, really. And you'll get all of the components needed to produce whatever it is that you, that pathway produces. That's called coordinate regulation. And it's very common in bacteria. Not all genes in bacteria are part of an operon and coordinately regulated, but many of them are.
right? And that's essentially what the operon is all about. So I'm going to walk you through, just make sure there's anything else in there that we needed to. Now, let's walk you through this image because this image is a very, very useful one, very good one. Okay, so essentially we have two regions in a bacterial operon. We have the structural genes those are what are transcribed into this polycystronic mRNA and then translated into the individual proteins. So by structural, we don't really mean they have to make a structure, right? They're not involved in like the bacterial wall necessarily, but they're the proteins that do something or the genes that encode the proteins that do something. That's what we mean by structural genes in this case. So that's one part, right? That's the kind of the information that's used to make the proteins that do stuff. The other part is the regulatory region. And in bacteria, that consists of what's called the promoter and the operator. So the promoter is where RNA pole binds. Operator, so where regulatory uh, proteins bind. And if you see, that operator is between the promoter and the structural genes. So if you want to turn off transcription, you literally just put a roadblock between the RNA polymerase and the things that it's supposed to transcribe. If there's something bound to that operator, you will not be able to transcribe, or RNA polymerase will not be able to transcribe those genes. Sometimes it actually physically blocks RNA polymerase from binding, but the overall effect is the same one. Now the protein that binds that operator, that is encoded by a separate gene. Could be right next to the operon, it could be somewhere else in the bacterial genome. It doesn't matter. But that regulator will be under the control of its own promoter. It will be transcribed into mRNA and then translated into protein. And depending on the kind of system we're looking at, or depending on conditions, rather, that regulatory protein will bind the operator. And in doing so, stop transcription. Now I'm going to give you a few moments to just kind of have a look at this whole jazz and see if it makes sense. Actually, you know what, while I do that, I'm going to go grab myself some more water because I'm kind of parched. I'll be back in just a second. Have a look at that and see, see what makes sense and see what doesn't.
Super efficient. All right. Does that all make sense? So every separator regulator regulator that we have has its own promoters that it signals when to start the process. Every gene has a promoter. Okay. Because every well, it's essentially the promoter, the main in bacteria at least, the main role of the promoter is that's where RNA polymerase binds. So typically in bacteria, in the absence of any other jazz, say for uh, over here, for the regulator itself, RNA polymerase will bind to that promoter and transcribe it. So this regulator will always be on in terms of gene, gene expression, right? Because again, remember, prokaryotic genes typically you know, almost always are transcribed in the absence of any regulator. And then the image on the left is just de uh, depicting our overall review of the process. And then on the right is whenever all the magic happens. Kind of. So essentially what happened on the right is really what we're focused on in terms of control of gene expression. So on the right, we have the actual thing that we want to control, the operon that needs regulation in some way or other. And so this operon will be turned on or turn or remain on or be turned off depending on conditions, right? Depending on other criteria. So the bit on the right, that's what we're going to focus on the bit on the left is really just showing that there's going to be another protein a regulatory protein produced from elsewhere in the genome that's going to play an important role in the regulation of this operon okay. it makes sense because the same principles apply you know you're going to have transcription that mrna is going to be transcribed you're going to have protein But in the operator, you see we have this operate an uh, operator in this operon. Sorry, you see we have this operator. This is essentially the switch or the bit of DNA that allows this operon to be turned on, oh, allowed to be on or turned off. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to look at two different systems in bacteria. We're going to look at the lac operon. And that's a negative inducible system. And the trip operon, and that's a negative repressible system. And so one thing I want to get like totally clear ahead of time Basically, there are two levels at which control of transcription occurs. Oh, I almost wrote porks. That would be unfortunate, wouldn't it? And that's big scale on off. Switching. And that's basically repressor bound or not. So it's either off or it's on. 
you know, big difference, like hundred to a thousand fold difference, Gonzo style. So a difference between someone whispering and someone shouting at the top of their voice. And then we have fine tuning. where transcription is controlled or set between those two states. And so I always kind of do the whole turning a dial motion when I talk about that stuff, because we're just kind of tweaking things a little bit. So keep that in mind as we talk about both the LAC operon and the TRIP operon. We're going to have two components to each. The big on-off deal and then the fine tuning part. Because prokaryotes are really actually pretty darn clever when it comes to how they control gene expression. They're very elegant in the mechanisms that they use. It's a little bit of kind of, you know, uh, trans kingdom jealousy when it comes to, you know, gene expression. Okay, so in the last kind of five, uh, 10-ish minutes. I need to leave a little bit before 12.15 just so I can run to the restroom. Um, let's introduce the TRIP code, or uh, the LAC code, LAC operon. Oh, man. My brain is just going all over the place. So basically, the LAC operon is, let's do it down here first. It's all about lactose, hence LAC, right? So lactose, big part of milk. It's actually what a lot of people are intolerant to. Um, and funnily enough, the ability to break down lactose in people is something, a trait that was acquired about, ooh, like 6,000 years ago, give or take in the Middle East, kind of Eastern end of the Mediterranean area as best as we can determine. Before that, and that's why most people of Asian descent are lactose intolerant, because that gene flow kind of went uh, north and west, not so much east. Uh, no, it's actually, it's, it's anthropology and evolution, essentially. So, obviously, we're not talking about uh, people here, we're talking about bacteria. And so, the, the thing bacteria love is, and let's just kind of make this, glucose. Right? Oh, yeah, that's also a good point, Dipper, as well. Uh, you know, most animals they only consume milk when they're, um, you know, before being weaned, basically. You know, it's just, just humans that are an, an oddity from that regard. So, yeah, good point. Forgot about that. Um, but what bacteria really care about is glucose. Glucose is what goes into... A uh, set of respiration gets broke down with glycolysis and the like generates ATP. So, oops. this is what bacteria want. It's not necessarily what they're going to get, right? So, depending on what substrate or in what environment those bacteria are present at, they may have a range of food sources available to them. So if glucose is present, all the other crap, yeah, just leave it for whoever else. You know, don't care about it. I want to eat the good stuff, right? And so the bacteria are going to focus on taking up and metabolizing glucose. Now, if glucose is not present and there's other stuff available, then obviously you need some means of using that other stuff. Right, but 
when it's not there, you don't want to produce the components required for breaking it down. So if there's no lactose, or there's no glucose, sorry, and you need an alternative food source, but there's no lactose, there's something else like fructose, let's say, you don't want to produce the bits necessary for metabolizing lactose, because it'd be a waste. You know, there's a lot of cost associated with gene expression. So really what the bacteria are doing, and obviously they're not conscious about this, is they're gonna go, okay, let's say I don't have, uh, where's my gonzo X? X, 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 it's in there somewhere. Here we go. <laughs> kind of like real time live PowerPoint editing, yay. So we don't have glucose available, but we do have lactose present. So now the bacteria needs to have a means of A, detecting that, and B, figuring out, okay, we don't have glucose, we do have lactose, now we got to switch on all the jazz involved in turning lactose into glucose again. So this is really a very elegant way of only ever producing what you need when you need it, but doing it a lot when you need it. But also, as you can see, when you have, oops, plenty of lactose, right? You're gonna be expressing the lacoperon and eventually you're gonna start producing plenty of glucose, right? More glucose than that bacteria might need. And so now you can start dialing back all of this to maintain the levels of glucose that you need, right? So that's the two different parts. Ah, come on. Right, no glucose and lactose, metabolize lactose. You're gonna need a lot of expression from the lac operon to do so. Once you start being successful at that and glucose levels start increasing, now we're gonna dial things back a little bit to maintain the levels of glucose that we need as long as lactose is still present. That's the kind of the nutshell of the lac operon. Oh, crumbs. You just have to look at my fingers like flying around again. It's a lot, yeah. So that's the nutshell. <laughs> Glucose for the win, right? So if glucose is present, anything else isn't really that important. As you want to use glucose first. If glucose is absent and lactose is present, uh, lactose can be broken down into glucose and galactose. I'm not actually sure what galactose is used for. No, don't know. Spat out maybe or you or broke converted into glucose. I don't actually know. So you need the products of the lac operon and you need it now, right?
But after a while, you'll start generating glucose, well, more glucose than you need. So you'll dial back expression of the of the lac operon. And the lac operon basically consists of uh, a gene involved in the import of lactose called lac permease. And a couple of genes, uh, main one of which is beta galactosidase, which are involved in the breakdown of lactose into galactose and glucose. Oh yeah, there's the other one. LAC A is something else funky. Now the LAC operon itself consists of those structural genes and then three regulatory elements. The promoter and operator called LAC P and LAC O, right? So those bits here. And a repressor called LAC I which is going to be the regulator over here. Now I'm going to love you and leave you for a little bit. I'll try and be back by 1230, but if for whatever reason things go a little bit longer and I can't get out, just hang around and I will be there. I'm not kind of taking a break for the day. So I'm going to dial out now, have a look through in the meantime, the rest of this, the more familiar you are with the words and the stuff that we're going to be talking about, the easier it is for you to know what you need to ask questions about. Cool. Okay. I shall see you in a little bit.